Hey, welcome to Crossroads Online. My name is Roy Cervantes and I serve as the worship pastor here at Crossroads Church. We believe in bringing a real God to real people through community and that the church is more than just a building, but a group of people that are walking together and trusting Jesus every step of the way. Because of that, we're so glad that you decided to tap into our online resources, but this should in no way be a substitution from your involvement in the local church. I believe that God can speak directly to you and impact your life through this online message, but every single time he says, go and be a part of my church. There are a lot of things going on in the life of our church. Take a look around, and we hope that you enjoy this message. And the family. She goes, mijo, sit down. I'm going to make you some tamales. And I said, no, that's okay, no, that's okay, Grandma. I said, no, 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 you're going to sit down. You're going to eat my tamales. Like, okay, in Jesus' name, yes, amen. And so she begins to feed us tamales and, and all this stuff. And it didn't matter um, what was going on, her surroundings. That lady made such an impression. Her joy and her spirit and the atmosphere and the environment in that home was not dependent upon the circumstances that she was facing. It was something deeper in that home. There was, as a matter of fact, looking back, God was in that home. Because only God could give her that type of perspective. This lady was digging deep, and it didn't matter uh, what, kind of, what kind of situation she was facing. The attitude that she had in life was not dependent upon her circumstances, her lack, or her struggles. She was joyful because God was meeting her at her level of expectation. Everything was a gift to her. She was a gift. The tamales was a gift. Her home was a gift. Those little stringy, ugly lights were a gift. Everything, there was just everything was done with an attitude. My point is, if you want to change your circumstances this Christmas, you can change it by changing your expectations. Here's what I know about every single one of us. In life, we often get what we expect. Isn't that true? If we expect something good, it has a way of showing up. And if we expect something bad, it too has a way of showing up. That's why the gospel, uh, Jesus quotes a scripture in Matthew 9. It says, according to your faith, let it be unto you. Another translation of that passage says this, have what your faith expects. It reminds me of a story about this wise clerk who worked at a convenience store in a small town out west. One day, this stranger walks in, and he picks up some bread and milk, and he makes his way to the cash register. And a clerk identifies that he's new in the area. He goes, hey, are you new to town? He goes, yes, sir. I just moved here with my family, the stranger replies. Well, then, let me be the first to welcome you into our town. He shakes his hand uh, very firmly. Thanks, the stranger said. He goes, hey, listen. He goes, what kind of people uh, do you have in this town? And the clerk very wisely says, well, what kind of people did you have in the last town that you came from? Oh, man, they were fantastic, the stranger replied. He goes, they were friendly, upbeat, and generous. We hated to leave. Well, I know what you mean, the clerk said. He goes, I think that's what pretty much you're going to find here in this town as well. A couple of days later, another stranger walks into the communion store. Like the first one, he picks up a few staples, and then he goes to the cash register, and the same clerk asks, you new to town? Yeah, I just arrived here. And he goes, following the same track, the clerk smiles, and he extends his hand. He goes, well, let me be the first to extend my friendly welcome to you to this town. And the stranger looks, and he takes his hand reluctantly, and he begins to look down a little bit, and he says, so what kind of people do you have in this town? And the clerk again, he goes, well... He goes, what kind of people did you have in the town that you came from? He goes, oh, man. He goes, they weren't great at all, he stammered. He goes, they were cold, aloof. They were selfish. We couldn't wait to get out of that crazy old town. And we're here now. He goes, well, sad to say, he goes, that's probably what you're going to find here in this town as well. Now, if that's true, you and I, we have an opportunity to change and to shift our expectations, right? It's time to shift those things. You can change your circumstances by changing your expectations. And I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate this because this isn't just mind over matter. Uh, this is believing the scriptures, the word of God, based upon who God is in this word. Amen? There was a study done by Harvard by psychology department by a couple of doctors named Crum and Langer. Now listen to this. This is interesting. They took 84 female hotel attendants in seven hotels these ladies were cleaning an average of 15 rooms a day, each requiring about half an hour of walking, bending, pushing, lifting, and carrying. These women were clearly getting a whole lot of exercise, but they didn't believe it. 
As a matter of fact, 66.6% of them reported not exercising regularly, and 36.8% said that they didn't get any exercise at all. So Dr. Langer, he tells the workers at, all, at just four of the hotels that their work provided, the work they were doing, provided good exercise and met the guidelines for their healthy, active lifestyle. But to the housekeepers uh, on the other three hotels, Langer said nothing to them. Four weeks later, she compares the true groups. And the woman who hadn't heard anything about the health benefits of their work showed no change in weight, no change in body fat, and their blood pressure was not changed at all. But to the housekeepers who heard that the work that they were doing was good exercise, by contrast, lost an average of 2 pounds and 0.5% of their body fat and experienced a 10% drop in their blood pressure. Isn't that crazy? The point is, go start cleaning houses. No, the point is, <laughs> you can get what you expect because they heard that. The text we read this morning with Hope uh, had to do with a Savior visiting a very dark, and chaotic world with a very bright and shining light. This light that would guide uh, these individuals into a better place. This light would shine brighter um, and give them greater experiences rather than, than the darker experiences that they were facing. Light would offer them hope rather than disparity. Light would give them healing rather than sickness. Light would come and offer them forgiveness rather than condemnation freedom rather than bondage, and joy rather than sorrow. He describes the light in this passage that Hope read in one word. He says, this light was good. This light was good. Why is it good? Because the source of that light is good. That's why he's, he's good. If the root always produces the fruit. If the source is good, then the product will be good as well. In verse 4, it says, God saw the light that it was good. If you take a look at Scripture, you'll see that several individuals and characters in the Bible all explain the same thing. David said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The brother of Jesus, James, said every good and perfect gift comes from above. Amen? Mark said, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good, and it's God alone. The gospel that we preach, it's called good news. The seed that we sow, it's called good seed. It's a good word. It's in good season, amen? Because God is good. The source is good. Listen, we get what we expect. When you give in to those negative side of things in life, you walk into the devil's trap, and you'll never get, you know, a break in life. Like, oh, woe is me. You ever, you know, know people like that? Are they sitting by you? We're not going to have a good Christmas. I'm going to be broke. Daddy spent all the money on that fishing trip. Kids ain't going to get nothing. We're just going to have to buy some fruit and apples or something for them, right? Listen, no. When you raise your level of expectations, the devil is blindsided. He has no idea what just hit him. That's why the scripture says it. Hope read. He goes, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness doesn't understand it. When you, when you go contrast to your feelings that are giving you these hopeless thoughts and these negative, this negative mindset, the devil just doesn't understand what all that is about. He doesn't know how to operate in an atmosphere of faith and expectancy. Natalie and I were in Bible school in 1990 through 1992. And the first Christmas that we were a part of in 1991, we were broke, man. I mean, we had nothing to offer our kids for Christmas but maybe some Snickers, Maybe, maybe it's just some little bitty treats here or there. But it did not affect our faith. We were still just believing God and trusting that. You know what, God? This is bigger than any kind of a gift. You are our gift. And we just rejoice in the God of our salvation. And we were just believing God for goodness to happen. We were going to make sure that we are going to have a great Christmas regardless of what we had or didn't have. Amen? Again, this attitude that this lady had was, was upon us. This is, comes from a deep well. Whenever you listen to Jesus and you spend time with him, he just gives you something that goes above and beyond anything in the natural mind. And then all of a sudden, we get a little letter in the mail. And this letter came from some people that we didn't even know who they were. There was a guy, a family by the name of Meckles. Now, we know the Meckles now. Jeff and Cindy Meckle were part of this ministry and still are uh, from the inception of this church. Well, before we left to Bible school, we, they heard about us, 
uh, at the church that we were from, and, and God had put our names in their heart since we had left. And so several months later, as we were out there praying and rejoicing the God of our salvation, God was putting in their heart to write a check to this little old Mexican family called the Avaloses. And when we opened up that envelope, there was a $400 check from some people that we didn't even know. And we were just rejoicing. We were so happy, and I spent it all at, on Pizza Hut. No, I'm just kidding. We, we, just, we just had a blast. We were just rejoicing. We just couldn't believe. There were so many things that took place, all because we didn't allow the circumstances, the lack, the attitude, the feelings. You know, you are not your feelings. You are not your feelings. A lot of times we buy into that we are these feelings, and you're not your feelings. No, just take these feelings and put them on a boat and let them just cruise on by. You just establish yourself upon the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you raise your level of expectation, the devil sure is blindsided. Now, there's a story uh, of a young boy in Scripture that I was reminded of this morning. Or actually, yeah, you know what, this morning. Because the Lord kind of redirected some things this morning. And so this is fresh out of the oven, okay? <laughs> and so this little boy pretty much grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, so to speak. Uh, he grew up with a lot of negativity around him. First of all, his name uh, meant from the mouth of shame. His name was Mephibosheth. It means from the mouth of shame. Shame has a way of creeping into our minds and keeping us from receiving all that God has for our lives. Shame is a lie that you believe about yourself that's just not true. And a lot of us have uh, shame attached to our mindset. Shame personalizes trauma in life and it exaggerates it. It's not the act that happened to you whenever you were a kid or whenever you were an adult. It's the lie that you believed when that act happened. There's an old statement that says, when a dream is shattered, a lie is born. You can go back in your life and look at the dreams that were shattered in your life and just begin to think and reflect, okay, when that happened, what lie did I believe about myself? And that's what shame was attached to this young man named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth not also had a bad name. He lived in the wrong side of town. He lived in a place called Lodabar. And the word Lodabar means a deserted, pastureless place. So he had a bad a name. He lived in a bad place. And Mephibosheth was also crippled by an accident of fear that took place in his home. At five years old, the hired servant that was a part of his household picks up Mephibosheth because she was in a hurry to hide him from the enemy that would come and destroy him. She thought that this individual that was coming was their enemy, but it wasn't their enemy. And in her haste, she drops him and he falls down. And he's paralyzed from both of his legs. So think about it. He's got a bad name. He's got a bad location. He's got a bad luck. He's got bad legs. This, this, he's in a bad situation. Now the king that's in authority is out looking for him. You ever experienced that kind of bad luck in life? You ever experienced that in your or family members, you know, who, who's, who, those type? Nothing ever in life ever goes right. Shame when they were young. They lived in the projects on the wrong side of the tracks. You know, they're paralyzed more in their thinking than anything else. They have this victim type of mentality. Everyone is against them. Everyone's at fault. They talk bad about the authority. They talk bad about church. As a matter of fact, when you bring church or the pastor or preacher up, they start foaming at the mouth. <laughs> you ever know individuals like that? Just negative, never. But here's the good news of this particular story. Mephibosheth, for those of you who don't know, he was the son of a guy named Jonathan, and uh, his grandfather was the king of Israel at one time named uh, Saul. And the boy was five years old when his father and his grandfather were killed in battle with the Philistines. And it was customary that the ruler, when the ruler was defeated, that the family would also be killed so that there would be no lineage left to come back and try to rethrone that area. And so all of a sudden when they had heard that Saul and uh, his grandfather and his dad, Jonathan, had died in battle, they assumed they assumed that the enemy was going to come and destroy the whole household. And so what Mephibosheth didn't know was this, that his family, his household, 
was in covenant with the king of Israel named David, that his dad and David had made a covenant together. And the promise in that covenant was this, to bring favor and blessing to that household rather than shame and rejection. And David, the king that was in authority at that time, he was looking for someone from the household of his best friend, Jonathan. And somebody tells him, goes, yeah, there's this family, there's this son who's out here in this place called Lodabar. And so David pursues him. And when David arrives at Mephibosheth's home, what was Mephibosheth expecting? He was expecting the worst, right? He was expecting to get killed. He was expecting, expecting a worse scenario. David's response in 2 Samuel, the ninth chapter, goes something like this. He goes, hey, listen, when he finds him, he comes face to face with Mephibosheth. He says, don't be afraid. I haven't come to destroy you. I came to show you kindness and I had hatred. I came to show you blessing, not cursing. I came to show you favor rather than shame. And Mephibosheth couldn't comprehend it. Remember, the, the darkness didn't comprehend the goodness of God. He couldn't comprehend it. Notice Mephibosheth's response in verse 8. He goes, who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Darkness doesn't understand the goodness of of God. And in the midst of that darkness and negativity, it's easy to expect the worst, isn't it? And here's the gospel message in this story. When we were at our worst, God brought us his best. When Mephibosheth was at his worst, God blessed him and be, with his goodness and with his kindness. Amen? David blessed the household. In 2 Samuel 9, 7, it says, hey, listen, don't be afraid. David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. We're in covenant. I'll restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at the king's table. This story needs to remind every single one of us that at one time, we were his enemy. We were spiritually alienated from the life of God. We were all full of shame and in want and hurt, but God, in the midst of our tragedy, in the midst of our ugliness, in the midst of our rebellion, he comes with his goodness and his mercy with the light of the world to come and shine his light in the midst of our darkness. He's seeking after us with his goodness. My old pastor used to say, Marcus, God's out to get you. Now you be afraid. It's like, oh, yeah, he is. He goes, yeah, he's out to get you with his goodness. I was like, oh, man, that's awesome. And he comes and he's seeking after you to get you with his goodness. I can expect my God uh, to come with goodness and mercy. I can hear my father's voice. Marcus, I'm, you're going to sit at the king's table. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get, instead of shame, I'm going to give you life. Instead of sickness, you're going to have health. Instead of rejection, you're going to have favor and blessing. That's what I can expect uh, with my heavenly father when I look at scripture. My elder brother, Jesus, goes something like this. He says, I have come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Amen. So this Christmas, the simple message is this. Expect God's goodness to pass by. Everything is a gift of God. As you pursue him and look at him throughout this whole month, every Christmas light is a glimmer of hope for someone. Every person that you see is a gift from God for you to embrace. God's passing by, showing you his favor and his blessing. You can change your expectations. You can change your circumstances, amen? In other words, another way to say it goes, you get whatever you expect. Pastor Joel, uh, in one part of his message last week, he says, man, life is hard, y'all. <laughs> a lot of suffering in this world, and I can see y'all. That's true, that's true. I'm facing it right now. And it's true, but God is good. I heard a quote this week. It says this, life is, the rest is an interpretation. Life is, the rest is an interpretation. I heard a story about a Christmas, it was a Christmas story about two boys, little Juby and little Johnny, who were both excited to wake up on Christmas Day to go and look at all the presents and open up all the presents. And so when Christmas morning comes, to their surprise, instead of finding gifts all over the Christmas tree or under the Christmas tree, they find a heap of horse manure under the tree instead of all these gifts. 
And little Juby immediately, he starts crying, jumping up and down. He starts yelling. He says, I hate Christmas. I knew there's not a true Santa Claus. Blah, blah, blah. He storms out the door. In the meantime, little Johnny, he's up jumping up and down also. And he stops and he goes around and looks for a shovel. And he starts digging in that whole, you know, horseman here there. Well, little Johnny, what are you doing? He goes, man, with all this horseman here, I know there's a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> right? We've heard that story uh, before. In the midst of your present circumstances this Christmas, count it all joy, regardless of what you're facing. Receive from God's open hand. Our favorite passage of Scripture, we quote this a lot, Pastor Joel and myself, Proverbs 4 says, the path of the righteous is like the shining sun. It shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day, until the fullness of day. You know, yesterday I sat down at my studio and I began to just write to remind myself of different things that God was to me, of how his goodness has followed me through all of my life. And uh, I want to just share them with you. I don't know if I'll get through it, but there's, I just couldn't stop writing. Let me explain. Before I knew him, he already called me. When I came running, he was already there to catch me. When I fell down, he lifted me up. When I was weak, he carried me in his hands. When I was afraid, he hid me under his wings. He's the king of my world. He's God all by himself. He defeated death, hell, and the grave for me. Isaiah calls him wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. He's the father to the fatherless. He's the mother to the motherless. He's the lawyer in the courtroom. He's the magnificent one all by himself. He's always on time. He's never too late. I call him Jehovah Nicotine. He's bread when I'm hungry. He's water when I'm thirsty. He's a bridge over troubled waters. He's been everything that I need. He's my shepherd. I shall not want. He's my healer. I shall not faint. He arrives before I even get there. He answers before I call. He's my alpha, my omega, my beginning, my end. He's the author and finisher of my faith. He stands by me when no one else would. He loved me when no one else should. He set me free from all of my addiction. He liberated me from all of my affliction. He buried my shame in the sea of forgetfulness. I no longer have to worry. I no longer have to doubt. I no longer have to beg. All I have to do is shout. He baptizes me with his love. No more hatred in my heart. He fills me with his spirit, reminding me he'll never depart. He's been good to my wife. He's been good to my kids. He's been good to our church. He's not only good enough, he's more than enough. He's the all-sufficient one. He's my all-glorious one. He's my all-powerful one. Nothing bad comes from his hand. It's all for our good. You don't have to run away. You don't have to be afraid. You don't expect his judgment. Expect his goodness because those, because that's who he is. He is good. His light is good, his seed is good, his gospel is good, his discipline is good, his plan for your life is good. So this Christmas, anticipate and expect his goodness. Call upon his goodness. Cry out for his goodness. Expect his goodness to shine all over you all the days of this Christmas season. Because if you want to change your circumstances, change your expectations. Because God is good. Amen. And I'm sure I could have just kept on writing, but I just started crying. I said, okay, that's enough. And so I find myself in places like that in life, I begin to remind myself of the goodness of God. So what do I want you to do? Well, this Christmas, here's what I want you to do as far as this particular message. The scripture says in verse 4 that the light was good. Two things. One, I want you to expect God's goodness. Expect God's goodness this, to shine upon you this week, this year. Anticipate his love. Look at it in a different light this year. Look for his goodness in the Christmas lights. Look for his goodness in the Christmas story. Look for his goodness when the children uh, that God has given you are right there in front of you just kind of begging for that extra gift or whatever. Look for his, his goodness in the imagination of a child as he's, as he's describing gifts that he wants to Santa Claus or to, or to dad or to mom. Look for the inspiration that comes from individuals like, like individuals that are really struggling in life, like the Traeglers. This might be their last Christmas together as a couple, but I see the beauty of God in the midst of their situation. I was inspired um, all this past year because of God's goodness uh, that was displayed through Natalie. All year long, now I don't know if some of you guys know, but if you remember, Natalie's word this year was joy. 
And one of the ways that was a, um, she would be reminded of her word joy is that she kept our Christmas tree uh, in the living room lit up all year long. It, it never went out unless there was a, you know, a, what do you call it? Electricity went out. It went out. But it would come back on. As a matter of fact, I don't even know if it ever went. My light bill was higher, but that's okay. And every time she would get discouraged, anytime she would feel bad, anytime she'd get mad at me, and it was, you know, just kind of prodding me. I was like, babe, listen, stop, stop, stop. Go touch the tree. But all year long, I would see and, and my wife go and hold on to the goodness of God, the joy of God, the blessing of God, the favor of God, rather than the circumstances that she was facing. So I want to encourage you to do that. Number two, I want you to not only expect, but I want you to become. Become God's goodness to others around you. Don't re receive it, but, but give them what they don't expect. You know, that was a very early on when we started Crossroads Church. One of the things I always would tell the greeters, he goes, hey, when you see the first time visitors coming in, give them what they don't expect. And, and, and so the same is to you as you are approaching work or your family or your husband, or your wife, or your children, whatever you're, whatever you're doing this Christmas, as you're shopping at Walmart and people are getting, you know, they're irritating you. Become God's goodness in the midst of that. And just love on them. Bless them. Encourage them. Amen. Last week, you guys um, had a major display of God's goodness and becoming God's goodness. All of our sunflower blessing things, they were all gone. And so, um, but this week, we found some more kids. But the, the sunflower things didn't come in, so we don't have them out in the tree. But if you're still interested in helping some of these kids, we have, I don't know, 20 or 30 more kids that we're going to bless um, to give them gifts this Christmas. Just go straight to uh, guest services back over there, or no, straight over there to the resource center where Cassandra's at, and Cassandra will write your name down. She'll tell you all about that. But become God's goodness this Christmas. Amen. I thought about closing with this story, and I guess I will. My dad gave me an example of that. I might have shared this with you sometime. I don't know when. I don't know how I share stories. One year, it's a particularly bad boy, teenager. Anybody ever been bad as a teenager? Man, look at all these hands go up. And dad was the old shade, creep, shade tree mechanic. You know, he would do stuff on the side. He'd worked at Hexel for 40-something years, faithfully. <clears throat> One particular year, he was you know, working on cars, over extra and stuff like that. But Christmas comes around, and again, we have our family tradition. And I wasn't expecting anything big, anything extravagant uh, from because I wasn't a really good boy that particular year. As a matter of fact, I counted the gifts under the tree, and everyone got more gifts than me. My brother got more gifts than me. My sister got more gifts than me. And I had one less gift than everyone else. And I counted them. I knew that. It was like, it's like, I was feeling shame. I was feeling rejected. I was feeling like Mephibosheth. Like, oh, okay, that's all right. I'm not going to say nothing. You know, I deserve that anyways. So everybody opens up their gifts. Everybody has fun. And, you know, my brother gets all these awesome gifts. I get, you know, underwear, calzones, and some socks and stuff like that. And my sister gets some stuff like that. And after everything's said and done, out of all that, my dad comes and goes, son, goes pick up all the trash and take it out outside of the trash. I'm like, man, geez, I'm really as bad. So I get all the trash, I put it in the garbage bag, and I began walking outside to put that in the, in, the, in the garbage bag. And as I'm walking out there with my head hung low, I hear my dad behind me, opens up the door, he goes, son. And I look back, he comes up to me, and he holds me, he, hold, he hands me his keys, the keys to the car that was sitting right there under that tree. He says, Merry Christmas. It was an ugly car. <laughs> Old Plymouth Fury, light blue. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Dad gave me um, a message. He didn't even know. You, know. you might feel like you've been rejected, you've done bad, there's shame on your life. But I want you to know your father's in covenant with you. And he's got the keys to your blessing. He's got the keys to all that you need in life. Expect him. Expect to receive that this Christmas season. Amen. 
Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. If you would like to give toward our ministry to see more resources put out online, check out crossroadc.com backslash giving. And don't forget, we have three services on Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. Hope to see you there.